thank you thank you shridhar for that uh, generous introduction and thank you kumar for inviting me uh, it's really uh, you know i want to congratulate you for setting up this institute uh, and really running it entirely on a personal steam and uh, with your students and other colleagues uh, uh, in sis so it's really remarkable achievement uh, uh, in and, and especially in the context where the middle east and its alliance for india uh, is growing uh, rapidly and it's a pleasure to be back with shri radha we had pleasure of hosting her some time ago uh, in in singapore so we look forward to more collaboration with you uh, as well so uh, when you know one of the reasons for the mia's success i think is uh, kumar's uh, persuasive power which is what uh, kind of let me accept in a moment of weakness that i'll speak on uh, on the subject which is you know geopolitics of india and the middle east uh, but moment i agreed to him i've been regretting it since because the complexity of the subject and the potentially the, the very controversial uh, elements involved in in the way uh, we have debated about it in the past and even uh, a hesitation to even to debate the elements of it uh, in 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 the public domain so that's been a long and complicated story but but having agreed now let me now uh, focus on uh, you know just to my presentation will be in two parts and i think in the first i'll briefly mention the broad the geo change in the way india thinks about the world that is the geopolitical change in india's perspective and then go to the second part uh, and make a uh, five propositions on what the middle east might mean for india uh, at a time when india's own uh, world view its engagement to the world and its relative weight in the world uh, has also significantly uh, changed so so on the first part on the uh, the nature of india's uh, geopolitics uh, we you know it's all of us has been the part of the debate for our generation at least as we grew up in the last few last 30 years a extraordinary change in the way india dealt with the world and i think to summarize broadly those changes while we had a contestation over how deep and how significant those changes are uh, today i think there's a far fewer uh, people who question those uh, those changes so the three broad themes of change one is how we think about the great powers uh, in fact uh, when we were in jnu the term was not even used <laughs> Uh, so it was generally there were superpowers there was a developing world there was north there was south so there was no uh, tradition of debating the world uh, in terms of the uh, how the great powers deal with it and how india uh, should should deal with them i think to summarize what has changed i think uh, it is from the resistance con and contestation with the west uh, as being a dominant theme of india's post war uh, you know post independence your politics today Uh, the cooperation with the west uh, has become a very important theme uh, and i think uh, it's seen that intensify in the recent days but the fact is from where we were in the in the in the 60s and 70s uh, to uh, the expanded engagement and growing trust in terms of how we uh, think about the west i think it's a is a huge uh, change uh, uh, linked to that is also i, I think the the change in india's own weight in the international system from the framing of india as a developing country as uh, as a leader of the south to one where today india is the fifth or sixth largest economy uh, depending on the dollar exchange rate of the day but the fact is uh, that i think has begun to you know compel us to think in ways that are very different from the way we thought about ourselves or foreign policy in the world so there i would say uh, there is a shift to greater pragmatism uh, greater self interest uh, compared to the the ideological and uh, you know grandiose framing of the issues uh, in the 60s and 70s the second i think big change that has happened is is about the is about the neighborhood uh, that how we think about the region uh, there was a time when the word regional integration was not used in the mea because largely we don't you know we are, we are sovereign states we don't integrate we call it cooperate or uh, that it is sovereign entities cooperating but the very term even regionalism was a taboo and even when sarc started in the mid 80s it was really not you know not great stuff was happening uh, the idea that we were deeply suspicious of what others might do and how it was probably a plot against us the sarc but today i think we think about the region where india has a large growing economy uh, can indeed lead the integration of the region so, so that's a big change how we uh, think about our region Uh, it's it's a so that is a, a big change that we, that is seeing unfold the third change is the 
the conception of what began to be called the extended neighborhood. And I think uh, it was Mr. Gujral who first used the term in recent, uh, recent times. But it's really, uh, put another way, it was really all your space beyond the subcontinent. And, uh, and in the Indian Ocean, Asian context, because we always had debates about Asia, right from before independence and after independence. But this framing of this as a, as a neighborhood that is just outside your neighborhood, uh, with which you need to have more uh, exchanges, integration, uh, with starting with the Lucas policy, uh, and then uh, the framing of the Indian Ocean policy, which is again, uh, it's interesting when Mr. Modi made the speech in 2015. I mean, I was trying to see if any other PM had made a speech on Indian Ocean, there wasn't any. That actually, uh, that we just didn't think of it as a space the way we think about it today. So I think that was a, a big shift. Uh, and, and how we think about the Indian Ocean, partly uh, we were the economic reform and liberalization and globalization of India made the seas far more important. Uh, and therefore, the conception of uh, you know, there is a maritime space that we need to deal with as opposed to merely the territorial frontiers in the north and to the northwest. So that change, I think, you're beginning to see, still full, not complete. Uh, so, but, but is nevertheless, uh, last 30 years, we've seen a significant change. So I think this sets the st stage to when we talk about the extended neighborhood, of course, the Gulf and the Middle East are very, very, uh, very important uh, parts of it. So as, uh, as uh, uh, Kumar said, you know, I keep saying Middle East. My editors in the Indian Express, uh, most of the time they try to change it to West Asia, but I keep telling them, look, uh, Middle East calls itself Middle East. Why are you so obs obsessed with giving your version to them? Uh, so, but anyway, but it's kind of, uh, it's a debate that goes on. And even foreign office uh, till the mid fifties, uh, I'm sure you guys know better than they were actually, it was called the Middle East, or uh, that it was only somewhere in the, in the late fifties or early sixties that actually the designation uh, official designation changed from the Middle East to, to, to West Asia. But it doesn't matter what we, what we call it in the end. Uh, but what I want to, as I said, I'll focus on uh, five propositions. But I'm, I, I want to say something here, that to think about a future in the Middle East, uh, we need to think about a past that predates independence. There's far too much, the assumption generally in discourse on Indian foreign policy, that everything began in 1947. Or 1946, when Nehru was the vice chairman of the interim government, uh, Nehru probably had an epiphany. Uh, he had a revelation. Uh, Non-alignment came to him, and that's the story. The great story of Indian foreign policy begins with the AIR speech in September 6, 1946. Or oh, that was the beginning of Indian foreign policy. But, but I think that fundamentally ignores a far deeper story that the government of India, as an entity, existed before independence. That the government of India. Uh, the Raj, if you will, or the, the, the British Raj, or before that, the Company Raj, both conducted foreign relations. That is both within the subcontinent. That's how the, the uh, foreign office's origin goes back to what was called the foreign and political department that dealt with the princes uh, in the subcontinent and later uh, with the, re the princes around us. So the, the, the engagement of India with the Middle East goes, dates back to independence, predates independence. And I think some of those features, not that we can go back to you know, the colonial period, but it's important to see the strands that existed because I think some of the ideas endured. Uh, today, when we say India's influence stretches from the Suez to the Malacca, uh, that was not, Gujral didn't invent it or George Fernandez didn't invent it. It was inherited from the Raj. That, that was the sphere of influence of India, British India. And I think uh, a, that it is what you're discovering. So, so I think it's important to, no, even just for purely academic reasons, how India engaged with the rest of the world, with the Middle East uh, before, uh, before independence. So, uh, so I would say, see, the, the five themes, I said, I'll speak about the changing Middle East. I mean, the first is about the, about the legacy of the Raj. I mean, that, that, that it is uh, easy to forget uh, how significant the Middle East was. Uh, one is the... Uh, so we say the, the, the story of the great game that today, which is a term that is largely used in relation to uh, the uh, in relation to Afghanistan, actually, but it's actually uh, also deals. It's also linked to the uh, the evolution of India's Middle East policy. That in fact, if you go back to the debate in the in the story, of course, begins with uh, 
when Napoleon lands in Egypt uh, and uh, claims that he's going to be a great champion of the Muslims uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the Muslim world, uh, the, the fear that a marching Napoleon might show up in India was seen as a fundamental threat to the Indian security, security of the British India at the time under the company. That, so therefore, how you deal with that threat, uh, where might you have to stop Napoleon, assuming he, because Napoleon himself had plans to advance to India, he was engaging Tipu Sultan, the whole beginnings of the, how the great power rivalry in Europe was beginning to have an impact. And the key to that was how do you control the intervening space between Europe, the Mediterranean, and India? That is, controlling the routes of entry into India and creating structures of influence and special relationships was the, one of the most important challenges as British saw it in, uh, in when Napoleon showed up there. And that's when the debate on Great Game in India, I mean, begins between the Cox's brothers uh, the, the, in, uh, in Bombay and the Lawrence brothers in Punjab, the idea of how we should cope with the potential hostile European power uh, coming to India. So, so the idea of great power rivalry and what it does to India, the Great Game concept was very much there. And I think it, it reappears in different forms. And I think now uh, we think of China as the power coming from the East. But the fact is that outside powers, when they come here, what, what kind of a dynamic that it produced between them and the, the sovereign uh, of India, irrespective of who the nature of the regime is, the Indian sovereign uh, will have to deal with the rival powers showing up and how that plays out uh, is, a, is, a, is a major theme. The, the second uh, uh, element of the Raj that continues is the notion that you know, India is the security provider. That, that uh, Today we have rediscovered that word. But the fact was, if you go back uh, through the uh, 19th and the early uh, till the 19th, till 1950, that is 150 years, it was the Indian army that, before the Americans showed up in this part of the world, the idea that someone had to stabilize the region, to use the current jargon of, if you have anybody from Seaport, they can tell you stabilization operations, peacekeeping operations, uh, international peace and security, blah, blah. So that, that stuff was being done by the Indian army. That the, while the Royal Navy took care of the maritime side, it was the Indian Army uh, that, that was deployed to different corners to, to stabilize the regions, depending on what the issue was. I mean, uh, as, the, as Kumar and your colleagues will know, Indian Army was in, uh, is in uh, Egypt for a long time. Uh, it was part of the First World War, a major component of the First World War was the Indian Army. And so in the, in the Second World War too. So in Iraq, at least, there are repeated Indian intervention of the Indian Army. So the Indian Army, as you say, look, it's good or bad. I'm not getting into saying it's good or bad. But the fact is, the Indian military capability resources were critical for maintaining the stability of the Indian Ocean. How we do it, who does it, I mean, that's a story. I mean, depending on who the sovereign of India might be. But the fact is, objectively speaking, if you look at the last 200 years, uh, I think the, the weight has not changed. And I think that's, that's going to come back in a big way. Second is the uh, also relating to the Raj Legacy third, I mean, which, which is really that India was the center of globalization in the Indian Ocean. That the British Raj and the economy, that 19th century itself was a great era of globalization when European capital expanded into, into Asia and it created a whole network of institutions, structures. Today we talk about China and this great BRI. Uh, the Suez Canal was dug by the Europeans. I mean, if you can think of BRI projects, I mean, there's still not one like the Suez Canal, which fundamentally breaks through, uh, you know, almost like Moses, uh, you break up uh, Mediterranean, uh, connect Mediterranean to the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the Red Sea. So Panama Canal, of course, are uh, the great cities of Indian Ocean today. We talk about uh, Aden, you know, Bombay, Calcutta, Madras, Singapore, Hong Kong. These are all products of the British uh, and the European capital expanding into this part of the world. So Chinese in some ways are replicating it, but the fact is, India was, and, and the, it was not, everything was not run from London. In fact, Bombay, Calcutta, Madras were not post offices of, of London. In fact, the Raj had agency of its own that the security, the economic factors working, that there was an autonomy. So if you want to, we can use strategic autonomy. We had strategic, Raj had strategic autonomy from London uh, in doing a lot of things. In fact, if those of you read uh, the book by Robert Blith, talks about empire of the Raj, that the Raj had an, you know, Raj was an empire in itself. It was part of the British Raj, but the Raj had an empire, uh, but especially in the Middle East, uh, 
in Oman, uh, in the Gulf, where the, most of the, uh, the, 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 the crucial states were run from uh, Bombay province, that, that the linkages, that, that the Raj was taking responsibility to run a lot of the political, economic dimensions. So, so I think that's, a, uh, we tend in, in terms of narrowly seeing it as a colonial versus post-colonial, we tend to miss uh, some of the significant aspects of the relative autonomy or the strategic autonomy of the Raj of, from, from London. So, so that's a huge, important thing to remember. And I think many of these issues has come back today as we think of India as a security provider, India as a center of globalization, and India as a part of the great game with the other powers. So all those issues are going to come back for us as we look at the Middle East. The second question, I, mean, I think this is a, a, a sensitive question, that, that it is the nature of the relationship between India's internal politics, if you will, or in internal cleavages, if you will, and the link between that, the security of the subcontinent, and the relationship to the Middle East. So if you want to simplify it, I mean, so you can put it as a Muslim question, for lack of a better word, that part of the problem when Napoleon landed in Alexandria, liberate India from, and that it will work with the dispossessed rulers of India to fight back. Now, this is, I mean, not that you know, Napoleon was fond of the Muslims or he had any, uh, you know, I, the, the idea was that, look, that there is resentment against British domination of India. The old rulers are looking for support and that any potential rival to British presence in India can use India's internal cleavages to destabilize British control over India. I mean, as simple as that. I mean, I think uh, the, that story, of course, is much wider. Those of you know the history of the Middle East, how both uh, later, the story repeats itself under the Germans, uh, where Britain and Germany were using Imperial Germany, were using supporting different Muslim groups. Uh, the Germans were supporting the Turks, the British were supporting the Arabs. So the play of using the ethnic communities of the region to destabilize each other's control over the colonial territories was part of the great game. And I think that was very much a part of the story. So it was not separate from the great game that that India's internal divisions could be exploited by, by outsiders. So that's, that was a story from, uh, from, the, from, from the beginning, and I think there's, there's no uh, escaping that. Second, but there was also the Muslim question played the other way as well. That is, if you go back to the Congress Party's resolution, the Indian National Congress, uh, some of the earliest resolutions complained about Indian use of Indian armed forces in the Middle East. That is essentially saying, why are Indian troops being used against fellow religionists in the Middle East? So that was an argument that was put across uh, right from the beginning. In the Congress, we're not talking about the Congress Party today. These are the suited booted types with pin stripes, uh, Paka Indian uh, brown sahibs. But the question of what should be India's relationship to what happens in the Middle East? Go back to Gandhi, Khilafat. So the, the dynamics of what was happening in the Middle East were of concern to the Indian population, of critical sections of the Indian elite, and that complicated how the Raj responded or the, uh, the, the governments responded. And I think then the same problem appears in a different form uh, under the, the problem of partition. Uh, once the subcontinent is divided along religious lines, then the nature of the relationship of the religious division of the subcontinent and its relationship to uh, the Muslim dominated the, uh, of the Middle East, how that plays out has been a, a significant factor. And I think it was a deep concern for India that Pakistan was pre presenting itself as a champion of the Muslims. It is a, uh, you know, cause of the Muslim cause. It is that Pakistan was an ideological state meant to secure the interests of the Muslims. And how independent India, secular independent India, a nationalist India tried to neutralize it by using the arguments of anti-colonialism, solidarity. So, so that tussle, uh, has continued, I think, in different forms, that how does India, uh, a, a, a multi-ethnic, multi-religious India, deal with a largely mono-ethnic uh, Middle East, that tension uh, between the two, and the partition actually sharpens those divisions. Uh, uh, that, 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 that has been an enduring problem. So it's reflected in, uh, in many of your debates, uh, how you deal with the various countries, 
are we for secularists? Uh, are we for, uh, you know, we don't like uh, conservatives or religious people. We like the guys in suits. We don't like the guy wearing, uh, you know, Arab dress or Iranian dress. So, so I think that that problem has not disappeared. I mean, I think even today, uh, it comes itself in different ways. Uh, there are some countries which call themselves the moderate uh, Arab states, uh, Saudis or Egyptians or the, or the, or the UAE. And Iran, which sees itself as a, as a state that is fundamentally seeking more radical transformation or the brotherhood that seeks radical transformation of the region to one a group of states that call itself moderate, uh, conservative, but moderate. And that, so that, that, that fault lines will continue to, to challenge us in terms of how we think about the region. And unfortunately for India, I think the problem is that we saw it so much in terms of an anti-imperialist lens after independence. It was all about the West American, the bad Americans versus the good Arabs. Or, or simplifying the region's contradictions, that there was only one problem in the Middle East, which was the Palestinian problem. There was no other problem. That rest of the region was happy, they would have lived happily ever after. So the, the you know, what I used to see in JNU as well, anybody came, we said, look, yeah, it's, it's really solve the Palestinian problem, Middle East will be a great place. That there is no... Uh, that, and when terrorism began in the 70s, we said, terrorism, it's not really a problem. It's really, you know, solve the Palestine problem, terrorism will disappear. Well, today, of course, uh, we don't like those kind of arguments who say solve Kashmir, terrorism will disappear. But, but the fact is, that was our line of argumentation. I mean, I'm not, it's not a blaming anyone or the perception of what the problem was in the Middle East, that the Middle East was deeply cleavaged, that there are multiple ethnicities, even within uh, sects, uh, groups, you know, ethnic communities, and that the contradictions between them are go beyond the contradiction between the colonial rulers and the, and the local populations. But the defining the region in North versus South terms or East versus West terms fundamentally prevented us from seeing the far more complex dynamics that existed. But it's only in the last few years and that we, you know, finding ways of dealing with it rather than the traditional simplification uh, of the region's contradictions through a lens of uh, anti-imperialism or anti-colonialism. Anti so, so that was a huge problem. And I think the problem today unfolds itself. So because uh, today, uh, anyone looking at the region, like all of you do in the center, uh, the contradiction between the West and the Middle East is very different today than it was then. Uh, the Gulf Arabs cooperate with the, with the Israelis. Uh, that, you know, the, to anybody who can, you know, maybe... Kumar can draw a map of who is aligned with whom in this region. Turkey and Iran are on one side, but they're opposed to each other in some other place. Uh, Yemen, you, know, you, you kind of talk about this whole place as a uh, messy, complex, multiple forces competing with each other. Uh, this could not be shoehorned into a simple anti-colonial, anti-imperial, anti-Western paradigm uh, that was very convenient for us in the past. And that, you know, whether the Professional diplomats, how they saw it is not the issue. How the larger political class saw it, that how they define that if Saddam Hussein is against, against the U.S., we are with Saddam Hussein. If uh, Iranian clerical regime is against the U.S., we are with the Iranian clerical regime. So, so the, I think the, the weight of the need to be seen as being anti-imperialist uh, in the Middle East, uh, of course, created huge problems. Uh, but it's only in, in recent years that we're shaking, uh, breaking out of that. Then there is the question of economic interdependence. This is the or the fourth point I wanted to make uh, in, the, in the that as we know that the interdependence, uh, as I said, India was the center of the globalization in the 19th century, and much of the interdependence remained well into the 70s. Uh, the Reserve Bank of India is to print the Gulf rupee. It was India that walked away from it. Uh, today, of course, we our heart burns when we think about you know the Jap American Chinese bringing the currency into the region. You are going to be globalized. Uh, rupee was already well-established currency in the Gulf. It was a well-established currency in Singapore and many other places. But India's internal orientation largely meant we pulled back. That, that it was a conscious Indian decision to separate ourselves. But the problem was, even we tried to separate, the logic of geography, the logic of economy forced us, banged our heads together with the Gulf. We said, well, we are separate, we are socialist. But then... Oil happened, oil happens, uh, they need labor. Where do they get the labor? They get to the labor surplus South Asia and within which India is the preferred partner. I remember when I was in Jainu, first time trying to get a passport, went to 
in 74 to, to the Shastri Bhavan where the institute post office, there was not a single person looking for a post. It was like you could walk in and walk out, there's nothing. Two years later, you try to actually travel abroad, go for a, it was like jammed with people trying to get passports. So it's a dramatic change in spite of the fact India pulled back. Look, we're not interested in Gulf rupee. We don't want to deal with you. Sell us the oil. That's fine. The rest of it, you take care of yourself. We are autonomous. Or we are socialist. We are independent. But the force of circumstance locked our heads together. And we've seen that the logic, the structure of that interdependence of India's dependence on energy, uh, their dependence on South Indian labor, uh, and now as a market for Indian goods exports, so it's a dramatic transformation that took place. And it is really a similar phenomenon existed before independence. It's really in spite of our uh, willingness to shoo it away, that interdependence comes back. So the question is now how you deal with the interdependence in the future? What happens if the oil economy goes down? Uh, how do you deal with the new uh, Middle East if, if beyond labor exports and import of oil? Uh, this is where I think the region is investing in alternative technologies and energies. The region is looking to develop technological innovation. So I think India still has options to, to work with, provided we pay attention to the new possibilities in the Gulf, rather than uh, simply seeing it as an as a, as a, as a old framework. So, so I think uh, the nature of that interdependence will change, but interdependence is not going to disappear from uh, the, the structure of the relationship between India and the Middle East, especially between uh, India and the Gulf. So the final point, I want to talk about is the, when we talk about India's geopolitics, it's a question of uh, use of force. Does India use force? As I said, look, under the Raj, I mean, India was the security provider uh, for the region. And when the Gulf became independent uh, in 1971, uh, Oman, first thing they did was come to India and say, look, give us a security treaty. You know, the British are going, so could you give us security? Of course, we, we didn't do such things. This was bad imperial, terrible stuff the big powers did. We don't do. We are nice people. So India did sign a, a security cooperation agreement with Oman, but really there was no interest in security cooperation because that was seen as a... So in spite of the political resistance, there's actually uh, with Iraq, there was a lot of training. So we did a lot of stuff like training. In Indian Air Force, I was, you know, I know those of you remember, Commodore Jesse Singh used to talk about his time in Iraq. The Indians went to train the whole lot of people. So there was the connection still. And if you look at even before that, uh, India and Egypt tried to jointly develop a fighter aircraft. They tried to develop a, you know, jet engine. Of course, with some hints uh, felt from German friends from who ran away to Brazil in the, in the, in the Cold War. But that's a different story. But the fact is, the defense was very much an integral component. But yet, we today, when you talk about India playing a role, I mean, the recoiling at the suggestion that India must play a security role. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the 2003 Iraq invasion, the Americans were very keen to have an Indian troops, two divisions of troops. Uh, a big debate, uh, the cabinet almost agreed, but last minute they pulled out. And then when the Congress came to power, there was a deep resistance to being engaged with the security politics because the, the principles of non-intervention, we don't get into other people's conflicts. But I think as, as the Middle East uh, gets into even a bigger problems, and the Americans retrench from the region, uh, how long can India escape using its military and force to secure its interests in the Gulf? You've seen the Chinese have got the first military base uh, in Djibouti, which is part of the Gulf, Middle East, Horn of Africa. Uh, we have the Turks, the UAE, the Saudis, the Iranians, everybody's intervening and everybody else's internal affairs. <laughs> but this dream that somehow there is this non-intervention as the norm, it's a nice thing we say in seminars, but, but it's the, if you look at the Middle East today, there's no better example than, it's not the great powers who are intervening. Uh, Russians, of course, are still muddling around after withdrawing from the region. You have the regional powers, Turkey, Iran, Saudi, UAE, actively intervening in each other's internal affairs. So, so military force is being used. So what do we do sitting next door? Say tomorrow if Qatar or somebody, I'm just saying, it's a UAE comes to us and say, look, can you help us secure? Do we say, sorry, you know, we're not going to do it for you because we also like Iran, you know, we also got Qatar as our friend, everybody's our friend, we are multi-aligned, we can't do it. But what we've seen historically, great powers, of course, you have to play all sides, you have to engage everyone, uh, but we are using force in a non-combat way, where to, to pull back our people, the evacuation operations uh, in, uh, repeatedly uh, to rescue Indians from 
a crisis point in the Middle East last 15 years. There have been a series of operations. So I think this problem, does India play a role in the security of the Middle East? Or is it only about oil, labor, and good talk? Or is there going to be, when the region comes to you and says, look, can you help us on the security front? Do we do it? So I think this is a big, big debate. We've not had this debate. Uh, I think that problem uh, of, of how do we think about India's role in a regional, when the regional security order is breaking down, uh, it's going to be a big one. And, and then linked to that, of course, is how do we, who, do we, who are our partners in the Middle East? Do we work with the French to secure parts of the Gulf? Do you work with the Americans to do something? Or do we going to join the Russians in their interventions in the region? So, so I think the issues of who our friends are, who our partners are, uh, what is the level of intervention that we can anticipate this is a huge subject, uh, I think, all those who do Middle East and uh, military and military policy uh, it'll be worth looking into. So, so if you conclude, then let me conclude by saying uh, there has been a dramatic transformation. Uh, I think the importance, the centrality of the Middle East beyond the, the question of domestic politics, uh, because there, the region has never made Islam a defining feature of relating to India. Mm. It was India that constantly anxious about how the religious factor will play. Every silly resolution of the OIC would draw in the whole Indian system into uh, outrage. Uh, but you've seen recently, uh, what, last week, I think, or a few days before that, uh, there was an Arab ministerial meeting uh, with the Chinese. Uh, the word Uyghur was not mentioned. So this idea somehow, you know, that everyone is viewing the world through religious prism, uh, you know, there are, everybody has problems, you know, everybody has issues. So nobody has a single issue is not going to drive anyone. So, so I think religion is important. And I think the way we deal with our minorities will has an effect. And therefore, for India, on its own reasons that it needs to have a, a, a tolerant society that, uh, you know, at peace with itself on, on, on terms that are, everyone likes. But we should not let that color our engagement with the rest of the world. I mean, this is a complicated thing, but I don't want to go too far into it. But the fact is that today, the region is looking to partners. The American centrality to the region is coming to an end. Therefore, uh, the kind of role we ought to play in the region that transcends some of the older questions, but it also restores some of the older questions. Uh, we've transcended, I think, once the India-Pakistan gap has increased, today it's no longer the Pakistan question in the Gulf that the countries are willing to have autonomous, independent relationship with India. Uh, it's no longer the defining feature of their worldview about India. So it should not be part of India's calculation. And that today, uh, they're looking for security cooperation. They're looking for technological cooperation. Uh, UAE would have loved if we could have launched their Mars mission, uh, but they went to, all the way to Japan. South Korea has built their uh, space center. So there are huge possibilities. But I think one that is open for pragmatic, realistic, uh, you know, mutually beneficial engagement. And I think it is that change that we need to, and for which we need to shed a lot of the old ideological shibboleths uh, that tended to dominate uh, our thinking on the Middle East. So, uh, Sridhar, I'll stop here then.